Okay, let's get started with Japan. I'm going to upload the rest of the Hong Kong Cinema Lecture when、um, I can figure out how to get all the video clips that we have to see up. So for now, we'll start with Japan, and then next week I'll get all of the Hong Kong Cinema, the rest of that lecture up. So again, I'm showing you this world map,、um, and you can see circled over here is Japan. So kind of right next to China across the bay,、um, and there's about 126 million four hundred thirty-four thousand nine hundred sixty-four people. So precise. And the population of Japan is declining、um, because it's an aging population, and people are having fewer children. It's a mountainous archipelago,、um, and one of the themes that you see throughout Japanese history, even in ancient times, is this contrast between the major art centers versus the outlying areas. So we'll see that even in ancient times, before writing,、uh, so in prehistoric times, and then we'll see it continue. Throughout today,、uh, and the Japanese people, again, since ancient times, have preserved、um, the country areas、uh, and have not allowed their urban areas to encroach on natural places.、Um, and again, that's been a continuous、uh, effort throughout the years,、uh, going back all the way to ancient times, and it still continues today, despite the high population in a small area. There are plenty of country areas、uh, that are seemingly untouched, but we'll kind of talk about that in a bit. So the main island of Japan is Honshu,、uh, and most of the cities that we're going to talk about, like Nara, Osaka, Hainan, Kyo, which is modern day Kyoto, and Edo, which is modern day Tokyo,、um, are going to be on this island. In 108 BC, Korea was part of the Han Dynasty that we talked about in China, and they brought to Japan weaving, bronze casting, a potter's wheel, rice cultivation,、um, and then later Buddhism. And we'll talk about the particular types of Buddhism that are popular in Japan and the development of Buddhism in Japan as we go on a little bit later on. So Japanese culture, just like I did with the first Chinese lecture,、uh, we're going to be looking at some pretty complex themes, and I'm going to be talking about them. And some of them might go over your head this time, but as we go throughout the class, we'll be able to see examples, multiple examples of each of these themes and ideas and philosophies and religions,、uh, and hopefully it'll make more sense by the time we get to the end of the Japanese section. So the themes we'll be looking at is the local animistic religion、uh, in Japan, which is Shinto, esoteric Buddhism, which is known as Mikyo in Japan, Daimyo and the Shoguns,、uh, and we'll talk about who those are in a bit. Zen, the samurai, no theater, and we'll also talk about Kabuki theater when we get towards the end of this section, and the idea of isolation. So some of the ideals of Japanese art, and this is actually from O'Reilly, and I think O'Reilly, our textbook, does a really good job in this section. So the first one is suggestion, that which is not fully shown, said or done, but is understood. So this is something that you see even in modern Japanese culture, and it explains why certain things are popular in Japanese culture. Uh, especially uh, certain types of foreign practices. So one good example I can give,、uh, and is in modern Japan,、uh, well going back to the 19th century, is baseball. So baseball is basically the second most popular sport in Japan, after soccer. And the culture of baseball in the United States. Also fits pretty well into the culture of baseball in Japan. So one example is when you're playing baseball, there isn't a lot happening most of the time.、Uh, most of the time, you're waiting for things to happen. So in between the pitches、uh, and the batter swinging the bat,、uh, there's kind of like a waiting. And for people who are big fans of baseball.
uh, that is more interesting in some ways than the um, actual action that goes on. So all of the preparation between the pitcher and the batter uh, and the people in the field is um, something that is suggested. So this is kind of like what we're going to see in other Japanese um, practices, so especially when we get to the tea ceremony. So another example in baseball is um, this kind of idea that everyone knows the rules, uh, but nobody says so, uh, which was related to this idea. Is uh, And I'll just give you an, an example from American baseball. Uh, there was, and you can... Maybe I'll put a link to this on YouTube. Uh, but there are certain unspoken rules that everybody knows in baseball, even if you're playing in Little League. And one of them is, is that uh, in the major leagues, if they're a rookie or a second-year player, whenever you hit a home run, uh, you can't look at it for too long. Uh, you're supposed to show respect for what you've just done, uh, run around the bases, and don't spend a, a lot of time looking at it. So one player, uh, and this was a few years ago, but you can find multiple examples. He was a first or second year pay player. He hit his first home run, and as soon as it came off the bat, he knew he did it, and he spent a little time looking at it. Uh, then he started to run around the bases. And right away, the people on the opposing team in the field were angry. By the time he got to third base, uh, they were ready to fight. And as soon as he hit home, a giant brawl broke out. So this rule that you're not supposed to look at it like that is not written anywhere. But everybody knows the rules. Nobody says it. Uh, you understand this. And he broke the rule, and he had to pay the price. Uh, and we also see the same thing where there's kind of different rules. So uh, a Japanese player like Ichiro who came to America, uh, he would, no matter what he did, no matter how far he hit it, he'd run as fast to first base as possible. In American baseball, uh, there's kind of an unwritten rule, unless it's the playoffs, that if you don't hit it out of the outfield um, or the game isn't, you know, it's not the end of the game, uh, you don't run through as fast as you can to try to get an infield single. But Ichiro did it, and um, people accepted it because he was an older player. Uh, so a second one is... <clears throat> impermanence, the fleeting or ephemeral nature of existence as a tragic note to art. So we're going to see uh, these ideas um, throughout Japanese history. And part of it may come from um, Japan itself and the conditions that people have had to deal with. When you live on an island and in a place where there are typhoons, which are just hurricanes in the Pacific, and earthquakes, uh, there are often tragedies that kill a lot of people that you have to deal with. And people, of course, are going to get sad and are going to grieve, but they also understand that this is the life that they have to live. Uh, and life is precious, but it's also ephemeral. It can disappear in just a moment. So this applies to modern Japan. Um, in the earthquake from a few years ago, uh, I was listening to interviews and Japanese people were talking about mourning and such, but they said, um, this is the nature of existence. Um, it's impermanent. Uh, and these are the types of things that we have to deal with. So when we look at Japanese artists, we'll also see this kind of like tragic, almost like emo uh, type of idea with some of the artists. And I'll tell some of those stories as well. So irregularity, which gives art a natural and somewhat accidental look. So this is asymmetry, things that seem to um, are organic, and I'm putting out air quotes, uh, meaning things that are regularly shaped. We're going to see this going as far back in um, prehistoric Japanese times. Uh, the first things that we're going to look at uh, from literally thousands of years ago, we're going to see this value in a somewhat accidental look. And then the fourth one is apparent simplicity within complexity. So those of you that are in design or in transportation, you've probably already experienced this uh, because this type of idea of apparent sim simplicity within complexity has basically taken over much of the design world. Uh, and designers try to create things, and the iPhone's a good example, that seem very simple, but within it, there's a lot of complexity. 
And we're going to see that again, going back to the most ancient times. Things that look simple or rustic, but they're complex and refined within it. So let's get into some details here. So Japanese culture and religion. The earliest religion is probably developed from a lot of um, various animistic practices throughout Japan is Shinto. And the etymology of this particular word isn't exactly known, but most people think it is comes from Shindao, uh, so referring to Chinese uh, animistic religion, the sacred way that we talked about before, or the way of the gods. So in Shinto, there is no main god, dogma, ethical code, or complex metaphysics, and not a whole lot of devotional images. So the image that I have on the left is a rare type of image. It's generally an everyday type of practice. It organizes life. It's not something that you have separate from your life. So one of the ideas in Shinto is that, that there are kami who are nature spirits. And these spirits can be thought to be uh, in certain types of plants or animals or even um, landscapes or they can be located in particular areas. And we'll look at that when we go on and look at some of the uh, Shinto shrines. On the bottom, I have a picture from the Miyazaki film, Princess Mononoke, and it shows a Shinto idea of these forest spirits. Uh, so when we get to Japanese anime, we'll look at that a little bit later on. So what's kind of amazing uh, about Shinto is that a lot of cultures, um, especially outside of Japan, China, and Tibet, which we'll look at later on, they left their animistic religions in the past. Uh, when they got something like Buddhism or Christianity or Islam, uh, they no longer practiced it. Um, but in Japan, it continued even after uh, Buddhism became very popular. So people think of Buddhism, they're practicing it. Um, sometimes people will say, uh, when you're born, um, you're a Buddhist. Um, when you get married, you're a Buddhist. When you die, you're a Buddhist. Um, but everything in between is Shinto. Uh, so these two types of religions aren't seen as being in conflict. And just like what we saw with Taoism and Buddhism, there's a certain amount of synthesis between the religions um, that explain some of the particular nature of Buddhism in Japan. So Shinto and art. The shrines sometimes uh, mark particular kami. Uh, we'll look at the Grand Shrine of the Issei, which is pictured here a little bit later on. And this shows some of the concepts of simplicity, but hidden, refined complexity. Uh, we'll go into more detail with the Grand Shrine, but the building you're looking at is in a very old style. But it's made in a very refined way over the thousands of years. It's remade again and again, like a fine piece of handmade furniture. Other ideas that are important and have been very influential throughout the world is the idea of essential elements. Uh, and if you kind of go down to where it says natural materials, the essence of a material. So unlike what we're seeing in what we saw in China and what we're going to see mostly in India a little bit later on, instead of thinking of art as I want to make this particular type of image or three-dimensional work, and I am going to choose the materials that will be able to, to allow me to get that finished product. Instead of thinking in that way, in Japan, it's a dialogue between the materials and the product you want to create. So as we get on, and we'll see this again in most ancient times, as we get on, we'll see examples of how this works. So another idea, and this goes with this idea of preserving the country versus the urban areas, is a rustic and unspoiled nature. So coming into modern times, having things that look like old or old fashioned or from the country, rustic, uh, unspoiled, like um, nothing has been touched is something that we're gonna see throughout Japanese history. But this unspoiled nature is uh, somewhat of a facade because it's related to this hidden refined complexity. 
So when we see natural areas, and if we go to Japan today, a lot of things that seem like natural areas are actually heavily landscaped and designed to look like natural areas. And of course, we'll see examples of it as we go on throughout the class. So the first type of Buddhism that became popular in Japan uh, was esoteric Buddhism, which is known as Mikio. And this type of Buddhism, which was imported uh, from China through Korea, was practiced uh, mostly by the elites. And it was a very intellectual type of Buddhism. Most places uh, throughout the world that have taken on Buddhism don't practice this type of esoteric Buddhism. We'll see a very notable exception when we look at Tibet, where esoteric Buddhism is the Buddhism that's practiced by most people. In Japan, though, like we saw in China, the most popular form of Buddhism is pure land Buddhism, which is known as Jodo in Japan. And if you remember, when we looked back in the Tang Dynasty, the idea is that there's salvation for all through the Amida Buddha. So kind of like uh, evangelical Christianity, you can just um, kind of proclaim your faith that the Amida Buddha will bring you to salvation, just like um, evangelical Christians will um, proclaim their faith in Jesus, and then you can reach salvation. So you could see how this could be a very appealing type of religion to many people, just like evangelical Christianity. Uh, it's rather simple and it's democratic. Anybody can participate in it. So the way that Japan has been organized, although we'll see very sophisticated organization in their societies, uh, like we saw in China, very sophisticated economics and such, uh, it did remain feudal until the 19th century, at least at the level of the elites. And when we get to the Edo period, we'll talk about how that works. So the basic organization is that you have a daimyo. A daimyo is a feudal lord. What a feudal lord is, and this applies to Japan and anywhere else, is someone whose wealth and power is based on land. So daimyo control a particular amount of land, and uh, they have... Uh, tenants and other people who live on the land have to pay tribute or rent or whatever to them. So each of the daimyo would have the specialized warriors. They would have a regular army, but specialized warriors known as the samurai. And the samurai build up their own values and, and types of practices that are pretty useful for the daimyo. So the samurai have these practices that are pretty useful for the daimyo in that they're, they have to follow exactly what their daimyo says and there's limits to what happens if their daimyo dies um, as far as transferring to another daimyo. Sometimes um, the daimyo are called generals because there's a lot of warfare amongst different daimyo in Japan. Sometimes they're thought of as generals. So a shogun would be a leading general. Most of the periods in Japan that we're going to look at, there will not be centralized power like we saw in China. Instead, uh, the daimyo will control their own areas. But occasionally, one daimyo will be able to defeat many of the neighboring daimyos, and in that case, they would call it a shogun. Rarely does a shogun control all of what is modern-day Japan, but we will see very powerful shoguns and how they were able to try to concentrate power in their hands. So Japanese Buddhism, uh, Zen Buddhism is what we're going to look at. Like we had seen, it's Chan Buddhism in China, and we saw that it developed. And some of the values that we looked at from Chan Buddhism made a lot of sense in Japanese culture. So the samurai thought that Zen Buddhism was very appealing because the ideas of a seeming, you know, kind of contradiction that we talked about before, of decisive action, 
and years and years of discipline, this appealed to the samurai. So the, the daimyo would often be um, attacking neighboring lords uh, and trying to have surprise type of attacks. Uh, so the samurai would discipline themselves and learn everything they would need to be the best fighters possible with their weapons and with other types of combat. But uh, when it came down to warfare, they would have to have the most decisive action possible. Uh, so remember when I talked about in the section on Chan Buddhism in China, uh, the movie Ghost Dog by Jim Jarmusch, which I highly recommend. Think back to that and how Ghost Dog acted uh, to show this idea of discipline and decisive action. There's also the idea of transcendental naturalism, which we saw in China with Fan Quan. Uh, and that also appeals to previous existing Japanese practices and beliefs. So spontaneous intuition. We saw that in the artist's in um in china and we're going to see it in japan as well and it continues throughout uh japanese history when we get to today we'll see the same sorts of ideas so uh some of the oh and there's also this idea and again it's it's kind of a synthesis between shinto and buddhism the idea of becoming one with nature some of the artistic practices that develop directly out of Zen Buddhism are the haiku, which I'm sure you did when you were a kid, um, and the tanka, which is the more valued form. Normally, if we were doing this in real life in class, I would ask you, you know, what a haiku is, uh, but since we're not doing this in synchronously, I'll just say the haiku is a form that's five, seven, five uh, syllables. And within those limits, uh, you can create something that is refined and profound. And it has to follow all of these other values that we're looking at. Uh, decisive action, uh, transcendental naturalism, and spontaneous intuition. So the idea is to come up with something that is profound, unique to you and your moment, um, and something that is not deliberated upon. And no theater is the style of theater that is kind of an elitist theater. Of course, that's what you see at the museum when you go there. Uh, and it comes from Zen ideas. Later on, we'll also look at popular theater, kabuki theater, um, and we'll kind of contrast those two types of theater. So in Japan, uh, there were two different periods where they had what's called sakoku, which means a locked country. Uh, they went into isolation. The first one was in the ninth century, and we'll look at the effects of that. And the second one was in the 17th until the 19th century uh, when it was forcibly opened uh, by the United States. And I'll tell you the story of that when we get there. So normally when we think of isolation of countries today, people see it as a bad thing. Uh, I should just say as a side note, oftentimes when they talk about isolated countries uh, in modern media or modern discourse, um, often from a Western point of view, you'll see that it's some kind of voluntary isolation, like when it's talked about in North Korea, uh, but just to say that it's definitely not voluntary that North Korea is isolated. But normally it's thought of as a negative thing, uh, but for Japan, we can see that there was some definite positives. Um, and I'll talk about this in more detail, but like what we saw in China, the Japanese saw the writing on the wall when they saw uh, Westerners traveling around, uh, like pictured here, uh, the Portuguese and their, their boats. And they saw that they could be potentially dangerous and to protect themselves from imperialism and control the influence on their country, um, they practiced um, isolation. So uh, the Japanese, like a lot of cultures, uh, are somewhat ethnocentric. So when they saw the Westerners coming in in the uh, 15th and 16th centuries, uh, they called them Nanban, which means Southern Barbarians. So barbarians, you can kind of understand. Uh, as you'll see, we'll get into Japanese culture, and it's very refined, and there's very specific rules about cleanliness. Uh, you can imagine when they saw the Portuguese coming in with their hairy faces and certainly not smelling so great, uh, you could see why they would call them barbarians. Uh, 
But uh, the reason they call them Southern Barbarians is because they came to, from the South to the port of Nagasaki. Uh, we'll get later on how, um, when they were practicing, when the Japanese were practicing Sakoku, that they limited the interactions to the port at Nagasaki. This particular form uh, is called a biobu. It's a screen, and we'll look at it later on. So the Japanese were fascinated with foreigners, but they also recognized that they had to protect themselves uh, from foreign occupation. So this looks like a lot. <laughs> it's not as much as it looks like. Uh, whenever we do the unknown images on the test, not all of these periods are going to be included because not all of them are easy to ask questions like that. But this will seem a lot more digestible as we go throughout the class. So the first period we'll look at after this lecture is the Jomon period. And that is not a misprint. It is 12,000, um, 10,500 BCE. So yes, we're talking about 14,000 years ago until 300 BCE. And I'll kind of explain how China or how Japan developed over that time. Then we'll look at the beginning, well, the traditional beginning of the imperial period and the Yayoi period, moving through the Kofun and the Osaka period. And if we still have time for the lectures today, we might do Hakuho and Nara period, but we probably won't get that far. We'll have to save it for next week.